All right, um, so welcome. Uh, my name is Vince Weston. Um, joining me is Adnan Sahin. Um, we are going to cover um, VMAX for you and talk about VMAX All Flash, handle your questions. Um, you know, Stephen was saying the, the focus here is really to make sure that you all get your questions answered. Um, as I like to tell customers, I know these slides, I've seen them, right? I know what's in them. I'm really here to do this for you all um, and for the folks online. So we look forward to taking your questions. Um, since you all are fairly well known and we're not as well known, I thought I would give you one quick slide of background so you know who we are. Um, Adnan has been here for 19 years. Um, he's our CTO for VMAX. He's a distinguished engineer uh, with Dell EMC. Um, MS and PhD uh, from Northeastern um, and available on LinkedIn and Twitter. Um, I've been with EM, Dell EMC now for 22 years, so I actually started in 95. So when uh, Mr. Foskett was buying his first array, I was already here. Um, and I've been here that entire time. So yeah, it's been a lifetime. Um, 36 years in IT, uh, graduated from Berkeley um, and available LinkedIn, Twitter, and any other way you want to get us. So just wanted to give you a little background so you know who we are. Um, and now we'll talk a little bit about VMAX and, and what we're up to, um, and then uh, dive straight into the, the technology. Um, we thought it, it would be good to take a minute and talk some about what VMAX is trying to achieve. Uh, our goal in designing our product is to support um, the most mission critical, ha, ha, most highly available, most scaled applications in the world. So we want to run, you know, the banks, the Fortune 500s, the, the, the things that are most critical to your environment. Uh, Chad Sackage made a joke a few years ago. So if you want to think about a zombie apocalypse, think about what would happen if every VMAX in the world fell over at one time. Right. You, you couldn't call 911 to make a call because a lot of the 911 systems are running on it. You couldn't use your ATM card. You couldn't use most of your uh, Visa or Amex or any other cards. You, you couldn't use anything. Right. The world would, would fall over. Um, so that's really what we work to provide. We work to maintain that availability, obviously with high performance, obviously at a uh, effective price. Right, so our focus is really on availability and scale, um, obviously performance, latency, all those things that are needed to run the applications. Um, in terms of the components we look at to build that, um, we're focused on the availability, the performance, and the consolidation. Um, as we look at how to keep things available, right, obviously you need to be better than six nines. Um, you need to have uh, real online non-disruptive upgrades, and we'll talk through details of all these things. Um, you need to be able to replicate um, both active-active uh, to make sure you have metropolitan type availability, as well as asynchronously to be able to send things long distance. Um, you need to have high throughput, right, both for bandwidth and for IOPS. Um, you need to be able to consolidate multiple workloads. Uh, at some point, you're going to need to federate multiple things together and have federated data that's consistent on the other end of a replica. Um, you'd be able to do all those things without having to buy thousands of systems. Um, and so they consolidate with confidence, being able to take open systems, IBM I, mainframe, um, being able to do thousands, tens of thousands of devices, being able to do snaps on all those devices, being able to do remote replicas on all those devices, being able to scale not only within one array, but across multiple arrays um, and be able to handle very large environments. So. Yes. On your, um, you're, you're talking about three different styles of um, connectivity there. What percentage nowadays of people are connecting I-series mainframe compared to the open systems environments? Uh, right. So in 95, when I joined, it was all mainframe, right? Um, and we came out with the open um, later in 95. Um, I would say that right now we have open only boxes. Um, and when we sell open, that's open and I-series because it's all the same format, uh, is probably 80% uh, or so of our capacity, um, and the mainframe is a smaller piece. Uh, the mainframe storage business hasn't changed a lot in the last you know, 30 years um, in terms of revenues. Um, obviously, the functionality and things have changed a lot, uh, but the open system stuff has grown dramatically. So uh, we do have some customers who mix, uh, and the primary reason that they mix things is for the federated data that we talked about. Um, so I have some customers who mix mainframe and open on the same arrays and replicate them. Others will do mainframe on one, open on other, or open and mainframe each on multiple, and then federate those together and do a consistent replica. Um, but being able to do both of them and replicate them all helps a lot. But it's about 20% of the business. Yeah, it's, it's less than 20 and, and dwindling, right? Because right. the mainframe side isn't really growing, the open side is. So um, it's it's... All depends on the on the week. Okay. So, and you said you went open in ninety in ninety five ninety six. Yeah. Wow. I didn't realize I was that early a customer. Yeah. It's like this this scuzzy pre fiber channel 
Oh yeah, no, the, uh, when we started in 95, we were running, you know, you still had bus and tag connections for some of the mainframes, yeah. um, right? And you had, uh, I don't even think we had FICON back then, right? It was moving to ESCON and then to FICON. Yeah, um, we had ESCON by then. Yeah, there was um, no FICON. And the SCSI was, yeah, those giant 50-pin parallel SCSI connectors. High voltage differential. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah it was a real it, mess. Yeah, I, um, I, I blew up a couple of HBAs plugging the high voltage differential cable into the open-ended... <laughs> yep. Um, so thankfully, all those copper connections are, are pretty much gone. I mean, we still do, you know, Ethernet on copper, but the yeah, Ethernet SF, on copper, the voltages SF, there are SFP trivial. SFP direct yeah. connect cables are way easier. Yeah. <laughs> so it's it's changed the world. Um, so yeah, our goal here is to be able to, to do all of this, right? And to make it flexible and to make it easy. Um, in terms of like IBM I, we worked with IBM to design a protocol called the D910 protocol that allows us to take the AS400 data, or it was AS400 data, load it onto our box and format it in a standard 512 byte block, right? Instead of having to do the 520 and handle all that mess, we handle it up higher in the protocol. Um, so we have customers, and again, the reason we do that is we have customers who want to run all of this and they want to replicate it and they want it to be consistent. Yeah. And so that's been the and pressure. And it's way easier than back when you had to emulate specific IBM model disks. Or, or emulate the boot drive yeah. of the IBM I, yeah. Um, so yeah, a lot of this has gotten a lot easier. So that's really what we're focused on. And we had a question earlier as some folks were going to the hardware, you know, how do you differentiate between what VMAX is doing, what Extreme's doing, what some of the other products are doing? Uh, again, Extreme and VMAX are both on the high end. Um, and we're working toward different markets, right? VMAX is really the giant scale. If you have to do tens of thousands of LUNs, um, if you have to do the petabytes of capacity and you need to replicate all that consistently, that's what VMAX is really driving for. Right? Extreme IO is the master of data reduction for deduplication and compression. Um, they do it better. Um, and for VDI implementations and a lot of the associated workloads, Extreme is going to be a more cost-effective solution than a VMAX for those. Um, now, interestingly, one of the things we've seen is yep. some of the things we've built here, like the Active Active, go over really well in some of the smaller markets. So we have some retail customers who said, you know, I only need 100 terabytes and I'm running in colos, so I'm not that special. But if I could have 100 terabytes in two different colos that are 50 miles apart and I could do Active Active and just bounce my VMs around so when my colo data centers decide to take power out on a weekend, my operations don't go down, that adds real value. Right, so we can take some of the value we've created for the high end and make it available down market, which is part of why we built the 250 that you all get to see the hardware of. Okay, how are you, how are you finding the adoption of VMAX All Flash with your existing VMAX customers? Um, well, the, the flip from all, to All Flash has been pretty, uh, pretty rapid. We started the VMAX All Flash about 18 months ago. Um, so obviously before that, its market share was zero. Um, though we did have a few select customers buying the hybrid VMAXs with only flash drives in them, um, but without any data reduction and such, the cost of that was rather mm, prohibitive. Um, and so the new boxes with compression and such have enabled us to get wider within the first year. That went to over 75% of what we were selling in terms of the dollars of product right. um, was do, flipped to all flash. So, do, do you have any you idea have which number in bytes, right? Um, well, again, it was in dollars. In, in bytes, it was probably 70% uh, of the capacity, 65. Um, but in dollars, it was over 80. Right. Well, flash is more expensive. It could, right. should, could, should go that way. Right. So, so do you have any idea which VMAX variant is the most populous in the wild at the moment? Um, so currently, uh, actually, give me a couple slides to get to the, the two that we're selling today, and we can talk about that breakout. I think that slide will really help us to have that discussion. Right. And Earlier, you were talking about the adoption of using VMAX for business critical apps. Do you have any ideas on how hyperconvergence is impacting VMAX at the moment? Is there any? Well, so if you look at some of the hyperconverge, we actually yeah. sell VMAX as part of a V block. And so we can do converged infrastructure things for folks who value the storage based replication. Right. Right. If you're doing everything in real, you know, native cloud apps right, and you're doing the resilient data constructs up in whether it's the application or in your middleware so that you don't care about the in underlying infrastructure at all there's no point in putting a vmax on it right i mean yeah okay it's fast it's very resilient so, so you have to worry about things. so when i say hyperconverged, i mean true distributed software defined storage so scale io vsat nutanix the nutanix ecosystem etc are you finding that is impacting uh vmax adoption most of our customers haven't figured out how to meet their availability needs doing it all in the upper software layer yet. 
Right? I don't know of anybody who's running an ATM system yet on native cloud app right? and how to guarantee where the transactions are and have that resilience and be ready to do it. I, we absolutely believe the world is going there. Right? The software will get there, the capabilities will get there, and within 15 years there should be minimal reliance of storage-based you know, protection and replication. Yeah, but right? I, I mean, at, at this point, if you look at the, the RAS capabilities of a VMAX, you know, just ESXi isn't stable enough to say that, you know, my, my ESXi servers purple screen too often for me to say I could run a storage layer on top of that and deliver the resiliency that VMAX delivers. So it's not even about how good the SDS layers are. But it's, so again, if you, there yet. if you have something higher in the stack, so that as your IOs come in, they're being split and replicated, and you've got the resilience in oh, the application. Well, now you're talking about right. moving resiliency to the application layer, and that's right. a whole different world. But as as that happens, that's likely and to be where this resilience, goes. Well, we're in the middle now of that shift is happening, and so resiliency at the infrastructure layer is becoming less important because we're implementing resiliency at the application layer. But, right. But it's going to take a long time. Right. And for There's applications... For the applications of the scale that I bought the VMAX for this application, and then I put 400 other VMs on it. The one you bought it for, that rewrite takes five, seven years. Right. So they'll get there. And as long as you've got it, if your other infrastructure needs to be consistent, you might as well put it all in there and replicate it in many cases. Uh, so yeah, it's we're getting some things for that. Yeah, there's various ways to do it. Um, so as we look at that, we do think that there's a large market there. Um, we do think that the world is going to head in that direction with the, the high-end resilience moving up higher in the software stack. Um, until then, we intend to be the most scalable, resilient way you can store data. Right? And that is VMAX's goal. We don't intend to be the cloud provider. Right? It's not what we do. We, we do storage resilience. And we intend to be the best at that. Mm -hmm. So we're not trying to pretend to be anything else. Vince, just one last bit on that one before we move on. Um, was that a change of strategy? Because it didn't seem originally that the intention was to go to all flash VMAX. It, it, it seemed that the strategy was initially that Extreme IO would take that market position and that VMAX maybe would serve high-end clients, but it didn't seem like that was the intention initially. So when we were designing the VMAX 3, we specifically designed it knowing that the cost of flash was coming down and we would wind up with an all flash product within the life cycle of VMAX 3. All right, so we planned for that. We did a number of things as we get later to talking about some of how we lay out the RAID and all. We'll talk about some of the alignment things we did that weren't necessary at all for hard drives, but were absolutely critical to moving to all flash. Um, so we were planning for that from the beginning in terms of the VMAX team. In terms of some of the higher level business, um, the business at some point said, hey, there's this uh, extreme IO that's available that has compression and deduplication that VMAX doesn't have to make all flash cost effective today. They decided to bring that into the business and offer both to customers. Um, there are multiple people who thought things might happen in different ways. Part of the reason you have multiple products is to allow the products to go out in parallel and compete in the market and figure out where you're going to deliver the best value to the customers, right? But you could trade that off and say that customers may have been confused. The ones that had heavily invested in VMAX might have looked at it and said, you're pushing me to a new platform and I spent years managing to build scripts and process around VMAX where you've now pushed me to Extreme IO and now I'm having to come back, I can come back to VMAX when it wasn't clear that's what you intended to let people do in the first instance. Um, well, so I work in VMAX engineering, so I know the, the message that we've tried to convey both to our sales teams and to customers. Um, I know sometimes the sales teams don't always convey it that way. Um, we also have times where, you know, products are represented in ways that don't necessarily represent what the products can do, right? And, and we get to apologize for those things and fix it with the customers. Right. Um, so in that case, um, if that was misrepresented, we get to apologize and, and work to make it better. Yeah, from a market message point of view, I think we got stuck in the it's all new, it's shiny, it's all flash, and those, that VMAX is old and rusty, and why would you put all flash in it? But that was all marketing, not why you'd really want to do it, because you want a VMAX because it's got the RAS. Right. Yeah, but if you're a, if you're a customer, that, you know, and you're being pushed down a route that says there's not going to be a VMAX all flash, if that's the imp yeah, impression I, you get, then, you know, you commit to something where you don't want to commit. That concerns me, is that you're saying the VMAX is, is the market, is the RAS, you know, Market, that's the big thing. You know, six nines, mission critical yeah. ability. What does that imply about other platforms? Well, I mean, if you look at, a, an, at an extreme I.O. That's what I mean. A brick is a dual controller system, and if both controllers fail, you're in big doo-doo. I mean, doo -doo. relative marketing message is well, but, weird, right? Well, it's, do you need five nines or do you need six nines? 
because for 99% of the applications in the world, a dual controller system is fine. Yeah, I agree. But the relatively small number of very, very important applications are a big enough market to say, and here's the, what, you know, when I, for me, when I say high end, yeah. it's, and you can suffer multiple controller failures. Yeah, it, I don't want to be the marketing guy for the small. product that's less reliable than the other guy. <laughs> well, so, no, but it's faster and cheaper and reduces data better. Yeah. The, the Extreme you know, IO guys. Every product has a unique selling proposition. Right, and the Extreme IO guys will be up in a bit, and, and it's not like they're building a 4.9 box, right? It's designed to be a 6.9's array. It is. But so. Within the but, limitations of the architecture. Right. We have, yeah. the, we have the history with VMAX going back 30 years that says that we do that and we do, um, we'll talk some about the reliability things that we do around how to do fault isolation and some of the other things that are inherent to what we do. Um, you know, keeping track of things in memory. We've got a checksum that stays in cache at all times for every 8K block of every track. Right? So every time we read data off the back end, we paranoid check and make sure that the 8K checksum matches. Right? It's not something that anybody else does, but we're paranoid, right? These used to live on stupid hard well, drives that failed but, a lot. But there are other ways to, to solve that problem. Right, but it's, it's, it's an extra check and it's the kind of thing that we do. It's a, you know, belt suspenders and some duct tape, maybe some super glue, right? We're gonna Thumb, be over cautious. Hmm? Thumbtacks. Thumbtacks. Um, kind of painful, but they'll work. <coughs> Hold things together.